Hello, my name is John McKinney. I'm a professor with the Global Health Institute School of Life Sciences at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, that's EPFL, in Lausanne. Today I'm going to talk to you about a once in future plague, tuberculosis, a disease that has been with humanity for about as long as humanity has existed, but as you'll see, continues to be one of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality even today. So I'd like to begin by reminding you of how human uh, history in recent years has differed from human history at any time in the past. That's shown here where I have graphed the total, uh, total global human population versus calendar year going back to about 10,000 BC at about the time that agriculture was invented and humanity began to congregate in cities. As you can see, for most of human history and prehistory, there was little change in the global human population. That started to change quite dramatically a few hundred years ago in which uh, the human population started to undergo rapid growth, which continues to this day. So as you can see, there's rapid exponential growth right up to the present time. So that is quite unprecedented in human history. Even more strikingly, in the last 200 years or so, the rate of urbanization of humanity has outpaced even this incredible rate of population growth. So looking back about 200 years ago to the year 1800, less than half of the human population lived in cities. Now, more than half of humanity is congregated in cities. Why do these factors matter, population growth and urbanization? Well, from a pathogen's point of view, our bodies are merely substrate for them. So having a lot of substrate congregated together in a small space to maximize transition, uh, transmission potential is optimal, obviously. So in a sense, things have never been so good as they are today for pathogens that infect human beings. Now, pathogens have learned how to exploit many different routes of entry into our bodies. Some pathogens, the malaria parasite being a notable example, have learned how to exploit insect vectors to become directly injected into the bloodstream of their bodies, a kind of optimal route of entry, if you like. Others enter the bloodstream through scratches, abrasions, and so on. But the fact is that most pathogens, including most bacterial pathogens, enter through mucosal surfaces, including the respiratory tract, the digestive tract, and the urogenitor. Uh, urogenital tract. These pathogens are, have learned to exploit the food that we eat, the water that we drink, and so on, as their means of getting from one host to the next. Uh, the tubercle bacillus that causes tuberculosis is a notable example of a pathogen that has learned how to be transmitted through the air that we breathe. So you, I'm sure all remember when you were a kid, your mom used to tell you to cover your mouth when you coughed or sneezed. As usual, mom was right. The reason that she told you to cover your mouth or your, your nose when you sneeze is because when you cough or sneeze, you produce huge numbers of airborne particles like this. And if this individual who's coughing had tuberculosis, many of these airborne particles would contain viable tubercle bacilli transiting from this individual to the next host. Now, when these bacteria are respired into the airways, most of these bacteria will impinge on the upper airways where they will become trapped in the mucus lining the airways that is secreted by these goblet cells, the bare patches here. Those trapped bacteria will then be swept up and out by the mucociliary uh, elevator, uh, the ciliary action of these uh, ciliated epithelial cells, where they will uh, end up in the mouth and then be swallowed and destroyed in the stomach. So in fact, in order to initiate infection, the tubercle bacillus has to penetrate all the way down into the terminal ramifications of the respiratory tree all the way down into the lung alveoli where they can implant the phagocytose by resident alveolar macrophages, the cell type that they parasitize within the lung and initiate replication. So that's the sequence of events that leads to just about every new case of tuberculosis infection. What happens following these initial events though is enormously variable from individual to individual, which to my mind is one of the chief mysteries and uh, challenges of tuberculosis and is beautifully encapsulated, I think, in this quote from a classic paper by the epidemiologist George Comstock at Johns Hopkins, in which he stated that following infection, the incubation period of TB, that is the interval between exposure to the pathogen and the development of overt signs and symptoms of disease, can range from a few weeks to a lifetime. In other words, TB is a classic example of a persistent, even a lifelong infection in which disease may not develop for months, years, or even decades after initial exposure. It's very common in endemic countries for individuals to be infected in childhood and not to develop disease until immunity aid uh, wanes with old age. So let's go through in some detail the steps that lead to the establishment of a latent TB infection and reactivation from latency.
As I've indicated already, the principal route of entry of the tubercle bacillus into the human body is through the airways. And the bacteria, in order to infect, must travel all the way down into an alveolus where they can implant and initiate infection, replicating inside macrophages. That's shown here in this micrograph from a human lung. So if you look carefully, you'll see that there are clusters here of sort of bright pink staining rods. These are uh, tubercle bacilli that have been stained with a special stain that stains only this type of bacterium. As you'll see, they're clustered within groups, and that's because they're contained within macrophages of the host. Now, the macrophage, of course, is one of the frontline defenses of the innate immune response in humans, and the macrophage is perfectly capable of destroying most bacteria that happen to enter the lung. But the tubercle bacillus, being a professional pathogen, has learned actually how to exploit the macrophage as its niche for replication and persistence in the human host. One of the strategies that it uses to do this is to block the normal pathway of progression from the phagosome that initially contains the bacterium to the lysosome, which is the digestive compartment of the cell. Now, most bacteria, when they're phagocytosed by a macrophage, will end up in, within the confines of a closely opposed vacuolar membrane, the phagosome, that undergoes a series of maturation steps leading to the sequential acquisition of different molecular markers, gradual acidification, and finally, fusion with the lysosome. This, of course, is the digestive compartment of the cell, chock full of hydrolytic enzymes that break down most bacteria that enter the macrophage. TB manages to avoid this fate using mechanisms that have yet to be discovered. It somehow blocks the progression of that nascent phagosome along the phagosome lysosome fusion pathway, which means that inside a parasitized macrophage, the tubercle bacillus is residing within a phagosome that does not acquire markers of maturation, that fails to undergo acidification beyond about pH 6.5, close to neutral, and which fails, most importantly, to fuse uh, with lysosomes, this degradative compartment of the cell. So the bacterium actually lives within the phagosome inside the macrophage and replicates uh, within this niche. So that's how infection initiates. The bacteria replicate within a macrophage until the macrophage is overwhelmed and lyses, releasing those bacteria, which are then phagocytosed by other macrophages that have immigrated to the site, drawn there through chemotactic signals that are released by the infected macrophage. Now again, normally this is a defensive mechanism of the host to bring macrophages to the site of battle where they can destroy the invader. But in the case of the tubercle bacillus, uh, this is merely providing it with an additional niche within it which it can replicate. So this process of growth within macrophage, uh, macrophages, lysis of the macrophages, release of the bacteria, phagocytosis by immigrating macrophages, and again, intracellular replication. The cycle continues for a period of about a week or two, and at that point, the bacteria escape from this initial primary lesion that's been formed, initially into the lymph nodes that drain the region of the lung that's affected by infection, and then they reach the bloodstream, probably carried there by the thoracic duct, although we really don't know the details. Now, uh, so this process of dissemination through the lymphohematogenous route is critical for establishing infection at secondary sites uh, within the lungs as well as within extrapulmonary organs. So the lung is, of course, the, the primary target of tuberculosis. That's its favorite niche, and that is the location from which the bacterium disseminates to secondary hosts. But in fact, in about 10% of all cases of TB, there is involvement of one or more extrapulmonary organs as well. And TB, uh, being a protean bacteria, can adapt to almost any environment and, in fact, can cause disease of the spleen, the liver, the bone, the eye, you name it. Any organ system is, uh, can be susceptible to tuberculosis. But the lung is for sure the most important organ affected. And by seeding through the hematogenous route, all parts of the lung uh, become infected with the tubercle bacillus, which goes again through this process of infection of macrophages and formation of uh, what are called now secondary lesions that are seeded by the bloodstream rather than the airway. Now at about this point, the host normally wakes up to the fact that it has been infected and mounts an adaptive immune response against the organism. And this is signaled by the arrival in these lesions of T lymphocytes that recognize specifically antigens of the tubercle bacillus. And in about 95% of individuals who are infected, that immune response succeeds in arresting the further progression of disease at this stage. About 5% of infected individuals and in particular those who are immune compromised for any reason, disease will continue to progress soon after infection. We call this primary tuberculosis. 
but the fact is the overwhelming majority of individuals control infection after this dissemination stage at a point where they are probably not even aware they're infected. They have no obvious signs or symptoms of infection. Now, latent infection can last a lifetime. And in fact, in old studies from the early 20th century, it was shown that latently in infected individuals who have died of other causes uh, will yield viable tubercle bacilli upon the culture of lung homogenates. So we know the tubercle bacillus, once it has infected you, is capable of persisting for a lifetime. Most of those infections will remain latent uh, for throughout the remainder of the individual's life, but in a minority of cases, about five to 10% over the course of a lifetime, individuals with latent TB infection will reactivate. For reasons we really don't understand, in a minority of latently infected individuals, reactivation will occur at some time later in life. So that's about a five to 10% cumulative lifetime risk of reactivation in people who are latently infected. When reactivation occurs, it usually occurs in the upper as opposed to the lower uh, lung fields. We really don't understand the reason for this, but it illustrates the importance of this lymphohematogenous dissemination of infection that occurs as an early event of tuberculosis. Infection normally occurs in the lower airways. That's because this is the, by far the best ventilated part of the lung when we are standing or uh, sitting upright. But reactivation and progressive TB usually occur in the upper airways. And th those lesions are seeded by the bloodstream. Now, let's look for a moment at the architecture of a tuberculous lesion because it's, uh, it's very common uh, kind of tissue architecture for a chronic inflammatory process. In an early granuloma, such as the one shown here, the core of the lesion may have begun to undergo a process called caseating necrosis. This is simply the, the death and breakdown of infected macrophages, as I described before. This core of caseation necrosis is surrounded by a mantle of intact macrophages, which, uh, if they were properly stained, would reveal large numbers of tubercle bacilli, which are, of course, growing inside those macrophages. Further out, we, there is another layer now of lymphocytes that have arrived uh, on the scene to try to control infection. So you can see there's a kind of striation of the lesion. Uh, core of caseation necrosis, a macrophage zone where the bacteria are replicating, and a lymphocyte zone uh, where the adaptive immune response is taking place. Now, somewhat later, as infection progresses, that process of caseation necrosis can become quite extreme so that a large core within the lesion develops where there are essentially no intact cells whatsoever. There's still a mantle of heavily parasitized macrophages surrounding that core, but now further out in place of lymphocytes, we largely see fibroblasts laying down a matrix of collagen and fibrin and other uh, uh, extracellular matrix fibers. It's as though the host is trying to contain the infection. But at the same time, this containment of infection within the granuloma may prevent, we think, the development of an optimal immune response against the pathogen. So it's thought that the tuberculosis granuloma may play a dual role in infection, both for protection and for pathogenesis. Now, going back to our model, if that core of caseation necrosis undergoes complete liquefaction, this can lead to the excavation of an actual cavity within the lung, as diagrammed here. This is a large hole, literally a hole in the lung, uh, where the tissue has completely broken down and has exited via the airway here. This is very easy to see on a chest x-ray. For example, here, this is a tuberculosis cavity in the lung of a 19-year-old, otherwise healthy male, who unfortunately was infected with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, requiring removal of this entire lung as a last-ditch measure to save this patient. So this kind of extreme pathology can indeed be uh, life-threatening. And within cavitary lesions where the tissue has liquefied, as I described, the tubercle bacillus now, it's thought, can for the first time undergo extracellular growth. And as shown here, where the bacteria are stained pink with Kinian stain, they can reach absolutely enormous numbers within the uh, liquefied tissue inside a cavity. This is a prime breeding ground, obviously, for the development of drug resistance, a problem that I'll come back to a bit later in the talk. Now, once a cavity like this actually erodes into an airway. The bacteria can enter the airway, and then when the patient coughs, sneezes, talks, sings, does anything that expels air from the airways, the bacteria can then exit the airway uh, outward and uh, enter the environment, and of course, this is when transmission occurs. So that's the complete life cycle, if you like, of the tubercle bacillus within the human host. And again, I want to emphasize that there can be a period of many decades separating the initial infection
step in the transmission of infection, which makes it very, very difficult for this pathogen to be dislodged from communities once it has taken hold. We can look at this in another way. So far we've been talking about persistence of the tubercle bacillus at the level of an infected patient, but this persistence within individuals translates into persistence within human populations. And this is nicely illustrated using the so-called SEIR model of epidemic dynamics in which susceptible human populations are broken down into four compartments, if you like. A compartment of susceptibles, that is individuals who have not yet been infected but who could be infected, a population of exposed individuals. These are individuals who have acquired the infection but are not yet transmitting it. An infectious compartment describing those individuals who both have the pathogen and are actively transmitting it. And a recovered population indicating individuals who have gotten over the illness and are no longer infection. Now if we look at a typical acute and transient infection like the measles virus, which has been very well studied epidemiologically, what we can see is that the transit through these four compartments is very rapid and unidirectional. So an individual who is susceptible and becomes exposed to measles will incubate the infection for a period of about two weeks before he or she becomes infectious to others around them. That period of infectiousness lasts for only about a week or two before the individual either dies of the infection or hopefully recovers from infection. Transit through these compartments is unidirectional because the acquired immunity that develops during infection is solidly protected against reinfection. So if you've had measles once, you're not going to get measles again. In contrast, a persistent chronic infection like TB shows very different dynamics. First of all, when a susceptible individual becomes exposed to TB, the period of time that elapses between exposure and the development of infectiousness can last anything from months to, as I've said already, decades. In other words, a latently infected individual can continue to harbor the pathogen for a lifetime. Furthermore, once an individual becomes infectious to others, that period can last again for a period anything from months to decades before either death or recovery occurs. In the pre-chemotherapeutic era, it was very common for individuals who had to have relapsing bouts of tuberculosis over periods of many years or even decades. This obviously maximizes opportunities for transmission in the community. Furthermore, an individual who has recovered from tuberculosis is not protected against reinfection. So an individual, unlike in the case of measles, where an individual who's had measles is not going to get measles again, an individual who has had TB can be reinfected again one or many times. So the acquired immunity that develops in the course of infection not only does not necessarily clear the pathogen, it does not prevent reinfection either. This causes the epidemic dynamics of TB to be radically different from those of sort of garden variety, uh, acute infections like measles. And this translates into an epidemiological parameter that is starting, startlingly different between these two categories of diseases. This is called the critical community size. This is simply a measure of how large a population of contiguous interacting individuals is required to maintain a pathogen permanently without burnout or reintroduction from another source. In the case of measles, this number is about 300,000. In other words, a minimum population of 300,000 is required to sustain measles indefinitely without burnout or reintroduction. In the case of TB, this number is on the order of one or 200, very small. And this explains, I think, why tuberculosis is such an ancient pathogen. It's well adapted to surviving in small, scattered populations of its host, in this case, human beings, which of course describes the state of humanity until the very recent history, as I described earlier. And I believe that it's this persistence, this unusual tenacity of the pathogen that accounts for its enormous continued impact on global human health. According to the World Health Organization, of the 57 million or so people who die every year of various causes, so this is of all causes combined worldwide, about one in four individuals die of one or another infectious disease. Among infectious diseases, the big three are tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and malaria, which together account for something like six to seven million deaths every year. It's worth noting, in fact, that tuberculosis is the leading cause of death worldwide among individuals who are infected with HIV, AIDS. These two diseases synergize in a really sinister way. Obviously, being immunocompromised due to HIV, AIDS infection predisposes an individual to acquire all kinds of infectious diseases, including tuberculosis, but it's become clear recently that having active tuberculosis also somehow accelerates progression from HIV infection to full-blown AIDS. So it's a real synergy between these two diseases 
which, uh, the convergence of which in developing countries has spelled a real disaster for public health globally. So two million deaths a year so, uh, attributed to tuberculosis is, is obviously a large number, but it's really only the tip of the iceberg, what I like to call the iceberg of pathogenesis, in terms of its impact on global he uh, human health, which is illustrated in this pyramid diagram here. So it's a bit like an iceberg when you think about it. We tend to focus on the bit of the iceberg that shows above the waterline, the tip of the iceberg, but it truly is only part of the problem. And in fact, the bulk of the problem, the bulk of the iceberg, if you like, that is below the water line is in fact what's going to sink your ship if you run into it. So it's much the same in the case of tuberculosis. We tend to focus on what we can see, what's obvious, which is the two million or so deaths attributable to TB each year. But in fact, that number is quite small compared to the number of active cases of tuberculosis at any given time, which is in the range of 16 to 20 million. That's a large number of individuals at any given time who are out there sick transmitting the disease, but even that number is dwarfed by the number of individuals who currently harbor the tubercle bacillus, albeit in a latent form. That number approaches two million. So at this point in history, about one in three people on the planet harbor the tubercle bacillus in their tissues and are at risk of developing disease. Now, if these individuals who have latent tuberculosis and are not infectious continued to harbor the infection only in a latent form, this would be a sort of interesting medical curiosity, but not much more than this. The problem, as I've already indicated, is that individuals who are latently infected are at significant risk for the remainder of their lives of reactivating and developing full-blown infectious tuberculosis. The lifetime risk for an individual with latent TB is about 10%. That number goes up to about 10% per annum for individuals who become co-infected with HIV AIDS. When we think of the implications of this, it's, it's rather staggering in terms of the future of global public health. What it means is that even if today we could intervene with some magic intervention that blocked transmission and new infection from happening, let's say a transmission blocking vaccine, for example. Of course, we don't have a tool like that, but let's say we did. Even so, we could expect to see over the course of the next 50 years or so, something like 200 million or more new cases of tuberculosis arising around the world due to the reactivation of infections that already exist today. So clearly there's an enormous need to tackle this problem of latent tuberculosis and reactivation, but the stark reality is that we currently have no tools whatsoever that are both effective and practicable to intervene against latent TB. The only tool we currently have to use against latent TB is nine months of chemoprophylaxis with a drug called isoniazid, and I don't need to explain, I think, why it is impractical to treat two billion people on a global basis with nine months of drug therapy. It's not going to happen. So this is an enormous unmet need, something I'll talk about again later in global health. And it has an impact on us uh, here in developed countries like the United States. Uh, we don't think a lot about TB because most of the burden of TB globally is in other countries, particularly developing countries. But in fact, what's happening in developing countries has a big impact on our health right here in the United States. These are data from the CDC where I've plotted the uh, incidence per year in the United States of tuberculosis among individuals born in the United States, shown in blue, versus individuals born elsewhere who have immigrated to the United States in red. So following an upsurge in TB cases in the 1980s, public health measures were instituted to prevent transmission, to identify individuals who were infected and case contacts uh, were uh, were contacted and uh, new infections were detected early and treated and so on. So this was quite an effective means, these public health measures, of bringing down the incidence of tuberculosis among individuals born here in the United States. But as you can see, the numbers simultaneously among individuals who were born abroad haven't budged at all. And what we think is happening is that almost all of these cases are occurring as the result of reactivation of TB from infections uh, that were acquired in childhood. So individuals living in endemic countries acquire the infection in childhood. They then immigrate with a latent infection to the United States and reactivate and develop tuberculosis. What these data, I think, clearly show is that failure to control tuberculosis anywhere in the world translates into a failure to control TB everywhere in the world, including in the United States. Now, one of the myths I'd like to dispel about TB is that it's an old people's disease and uh, that it uh, mainly preys on those whose immune systems have waned uh, due to 
old age or to immunosuppressive therapy and so on. In fact, the reality is that around the world, tuberculosis is overwhelmingly a disease of young adults. And that's illustrated in the graphs shown here, where, as you can see, looking on this side, uh, at the age distribution along the y-axis versus number of TB deaths along the x-axis, TB deaths are overwhelmingly concentrated among adults in the age group 15 to 59. It's very similar, in fact, to the demographic distribution of AIDS cases around the world, which again primarily afflicts young adults. This is in stark contrast to most other infectious diseases as shown here. So these are the data compiled for all infectious diseases except tuberculosis and AIDS. And as you can see, in contrast to tuberculosis, most infectious diseases prey overwhelmingly on the very young. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because TB and AIDS, since they remove precisely those individuals in whom society is already invested, and those individuals who are sort of the backbone of the socioeconomic structure in societies, have a disproportionate impact. Yes, they kill large numbers of people, but they also kill that segment of the population that populations can uh, ill afford to lose. This is particularly true in developing countries where uh, social security systems, for example, may not exist, and where young adults usually have dependence in both the young and the old age categories. In fact, it might surprise you to know that tuberculosis continues to be the third leading cause of death worldwide among young adults aged 15 to 59, HIV AIDS being first and ischemic heart disease uh, being second. TB is also the third leading cause of morbidity among uh, the young adult age group measured in terms of disability adjusted life years rather than deaths. So this is a metric that was devised by Murray and Lopez at uh, Harvard University in the mid-1990s, which attempts to capture the disease burden caused by a condition uh, apart from simple mortality. So I think it's quite interesting in this context, for example, just as an aside, that unipolar depressive disorders, which do not show up in the mortality charts at all, have now become the second leading cause of disability adjusted life years lost worldwide and are slated to become the leading cause within the next few decades. This matters a great deal, uh, how we quantify the burden of disease, because of course the allocation of resources follows the perceived need. So when we focus on morbidity rather than mortality, we target rather different conditions.